aware of the time. So um, thank you all for joining us for this, our final, um, our final evening program of 2020. Um, we appreciate all of you who have joined us on this crazy journey with our virtual programming. And we do have lots of exciting programs um, already scheduled for 2021. Um, before I hand things over to tonight's presenter, I wanted to first thank our Nature Program Series sponsors, Hancock Lumber and Ragged Mountain Equipment for their continued financial support. Um, I also want to thank all of you who are members of Tin Mountain um, because that support is very important for us keeping these nature program series going as well. Um, if you're not currently a member of Tin Mountain and would like to do so, you can join right on our website in the top right corner. There's a um, about us and you can and support us tab that you can join membership. Um, if becoming a member is not the right thing for you right now, you're also able to donate directly to our nature program series um, on that page as well and help us keep these virtual programs going. Um, trying to think what some, so we have, we have actually very exciting. We have a, um, a, a youth program, a youth um, nature journaling program coming up the beginning of January we have um, on that, and that's a virtual program on Saturday the 9th. Um, and then I'm all, we're also excited to have um, the state's moose project leader with New Hampshire Fishing Game. Um, for years and years and years, we were always excited to have Christine Rines, um, the former project leader, join us. Um, uh, you know, she has since retired. So this will be the first person to have with the new project leader. Um, Henry Jones, that's on the 21st. Um, and we have a number of um, other programs as well um, that you'll see in our emails coming out. But tonight we are here um, to talk and learn about birds, specifically winter birds. Um, and our board member, Will Broussard, is going to, uh, to do that for us. Um, and just a reminder, it's also a great refresher for the Christmas bird count. We are carrying out the 32nd annual North Conway area Christmas bird count this Saturday. I see a lot of counters uh, out there right now watching this program. So you guys will be all set and, uh, you know, all set and sharp for, uh, for counting. And it's looking like a lovely day. And that's what we need this year. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand things over to Will. Great. Thank you. All right. I will share my screen and get us started. Okay. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to join you all once again throughout this um, crazy 2020. It's been a great year for birding um, as we found that um, birding as a hobby has really gained in, uh, I want to say, acceptance and uh, and it's gained adherence through this year. I really hope that continues. Um, it's it's uh, it's something that has sustained me um, through this year and through my lifetime. So it's uh, something I love to share with um, family and friends. And the winter, uh, it's just as it can be just as stunning as the summertime um, for birders. So once again, this is going to be kind of a, an identifying uh, of our winter resident and um, migrant birds that come into the States, into uh, New Hampshire uh, in particular, um, to get us really focused for our bird count coming up on Saturday, the 32nd annual um, North Conway area bird count. So we are going to be focusing on identification based on um, field marks and behavior. What I have included in this presentation will be uh, species that we're likely to see around the North Conway area specifically inland species. And I say that to uh, separate out those species from some birds that you'd be seeing more commonly on the coast and on the open ocean. So the pelagic species. So we're really gonna focus on those inland species of birds that we're likely to see. 
and I broke them down based on general habitat. So we'll go through and we'll talk about some of those species that are more likely to be seen in the forest, open land, uh, backyards slash orchard slash feeder areas, and rivers and open water. And uh, it's pretty incredible when you do get some open water and in inland areas, the kinds of, um, for instance, waterfowl that you might see um, typically on the coast, they might, some of these species might come inland um, as long as there's open water. So maybe we'll get a chance to see some of these this weekend. I know that uh, the weather's supposed to be pretty good. Um, highs will be perhaps upper 30s, low 40s. So fingers crossed for a pretty, pretty nice day to get out um, to check out our, our birds for the bird count. So just some background information about the count itself. It was actually proposed in 1900 as an alternative to the Christmas Day tradition at the time, which was going out with your family and shooting birds. Um, so this has been a, a, you know, a great alternative to that older tradition. Um, and now we're counting birds for, you know, 120 years now. Um, all of these Christmas bird counts are conducted within a 15 mile radius count circle um, using uh, at least 10 volunteers and a compiler to manage the numbers. Um, and this, uh, this survey takes place from December 14th to January 5th. So counts all over the country and all over the world are taking place between these dates. And I always find it fascinating some of the superlatives from uh, from this count. The most reported species at any US location is 250, which took place in Texas in 2005. And the greatest number of species ever reported by a Christmas bird count anywhere in the world is 531 species in 2013 in Ecuador. So that's pretty awesome to be out and see that many species. And so as of 2015, the Christmas bird count um, became the longest running citizen science survey in the world, which is pretty exciting to be part of. And it seems like this year we've got a lot of great volunteers coming out to uh, help support us in this uh, effort. So um, just a little background on the species that we're going to be talking about. All of these species that are coming into New Hampshire are going to be uh, kind of um, well, kind of utilizing different migration strategies. So the most common um, birds that we're gonna be seeing are those that are breeding residents. So birds like our cardinals and our downy woodpeckers, birds that find their resources um, on the landscape in New Hampshire year round. So they don't really go anywhere. Um, the next kind of group that we will often be seeing on these winter bird counts will be the wintering migrants. So those species that come into New Hampshire in winter time. Those are the species like American tree sparrow and snowy owl, which will be breeding much further north in the boreal forests or in the Arctic zones of um, North America and actually spend their winters down here in New Hampshire. And um, also we're going to have some amount of um, breeding migrants that are summer only. These, um, for instance, the, the short distance breeding migrants um, might still be around in small numbers, birds like red winged blackbird and woodcock, which um, will linger into the fall and into the winter, um, but may be completely vacated um, from New Hampshire by January, February, especially when you get some of that really cold air settling in. Um, and then species that we're really not going to see so much are the long distance breeding migrants. Those are our broad winged hawks and our red eyed vireos. Lots of those warblers that we're seeing in the spring those beautiful different colored tanagers. Um, those birds have all vacated usually by late October. They're pretty much out of here. Um, but uh, you never know. Sometimes you, you get um, some rarities like uh, last February, I believe we had the painted bunting at the Nature Learning Center in Albany, Tin Mountain, which was really exciting. So sometimes um, you'll get those long distance breeding migrants that get a little bit off course and uh, might show up in our Christmas bird count. 
A couple more migration strategies include the eruptive migrants. So these are species that follow um, cone mast crops. So um, spruce and uh, fir uh, trees will on kind of a, an irregular schedule um, mast out uh, an overwhelming um, number of seeds. Um, and, and that is to help uh, over overwhelm their own predators, their own uh, mammalian predators, for instance, and help to seed in um, new generation um, every several years or so. Um, but that also has the side effect of helping out um, some birds. But then in those years where those trees are not producing mast, those birds have to come south to find food. So birds like our red poles, evening grosbeaks, um, pine siskins, things like that. There's also the passage migrants. These are some uh, species that probably not likely to get um, so much here in, in the deep winter, but these are birds that are migrating from um, much further north and will stick around for maybe a few weeks uh, during migration and then winter much further south. So white crowned sparrows, American golden plovers fit that description. And then kind of finally, we've got a migration strategy called the nomad, uh, nomadic strategy, where you have um, birds just uh, following specific um, food sources and will actually be breeding basically wherever those uh, food sources are in abundance. So birds like our red crossbill are like that. Um, so that's a pretty um, uh, varied in the different kinds of migration strategies that we have. And um, there are all kinds of different uh, birds that we get here in New Hampshire that um, follow these different strategies. So just some um, visualization of these strategies. So on the left, we've got um, the that classic um, breeding migrant species, the black pole warbler, um, one that's here actually in the higher elevations um, of New Hampshire in the summertime that's going to be migrating south into northern South America um, in the winter. So we're not going to get that uh, species on the um, on the Christmas bird count, although you never know, Vermont had its, uh, I believe, its second ever December record for Cape May warbler uh, two weeks ago. So. Um, that's pretty interesting. There are some warblers that are sticking around um, further north this year. Um, and then on the other side of the coin, you've got white winged crossbill, one of the more um, classic eruptive migrants. Although we get this one and the red crossbill throughout New Hampshire um, year round where their, where their food is um, in abundance. But you can just kind of compare those different breeding strategies in, um, in map form, which is uh, pretty nice to, to see and, and take in. My friend and former Tin Mountain uh, co-worker, Sean Ash, created this great uh, photo a long time ago to help us remember the eruption that happens of uh, different species, of course, depending on their food availabilities um, where they are in the wintertime. So even though I talked about eruptive migrants um, being, you know, things like the siskin finch and the red, uh, and red crossbill and white winged crossbill and things like that. Uh, things like our snowy owls can also be an eruptive um, migrant because many, um, much of their diet is, is uh, uh, based in small rodents, which actually can, um, those populations can uh, go up and go down as well. And so when there's a lot of um, owls produced uh, and then perhaps the following year, not enough um, voles, they have to come south. And so some years you get tons of owls. Um, uh, just, I believe three years ago, we had quite a lot with owls reaching down into the mid-Atlantic and even Bermuda, which is pretty incredible. So this year, um, it, this uh, the the Finch Network um, that we follow, the Winter Finch Net uh, forecast, which is produced by the Finch Research Network, creates this um, incredible 
forecast. Um, it was done for a long time by um, Ron Pittaway, and now it's done by Tyler Hoare. And this is a, um, a really exceptional forecast um, product uh, for a number of different species that come south um, each winter in relative abundance. And um, this year was actually a pretty incredible year for many species. For those of us keeping track um, out our windows and going birding this fall, uh, the, the first sign, at least for me, of a large eruption year for um, for many uh, finches really started with purple finches. Um, when I was out on Monhegan Island and then down here on the coast of Maine birding in October, huge flocks of purple finches were coming through and just clearing out uh, our bird feeders in, in hours. Um, so they came through and then um, the uh, pine siskins a couple weeks after that were coming through in big numbers. Um, this year is also a big year for red breasted nuthatches. And interestingly enough, we've got quite a lot of pine grosbeaks beaks and evening grosbeaks beaks here in um, southern Maine and, and back in uh, where I am, but also back in North Conway. So there's a good chance that we'll get some of these species on the winter bird count. Um, for some of the earlier uh, species I mentioned, like the purple finch, they kind of came through and are in smaller numbers um, now because the, their bigger pulse came through in October. And so um, we'll get them again kind of on their uh, northern migration back uh, at the end of March, April time frame. So many of these species come down again, um, just depending on the food availability further north. So we'll talk about some of those eruptive finches um, as we get through the presentation. So as I said, I will break it up based on um, the different uh, habitats that we generally have um, in central New Hampshire. So uh, forests is one of the largest um, kind of ecological groupings that we have. So various types of forests exist in the landscape. Um, and with that, we have, of course, one of the uh, number one bird uh, types that utilize the forest, the woodpeckers. On the right, we have the largest woodpecker um, in the state of New Hampshire, the Pileated, uh, which we have in um, good numbers uh, in New Hampshire, and hopefully we'll get some on the Christmas bird count. On the left, um, we have kind of a, a slew of medium-sized woodpeckers that are um, short distance migrants. So the yellow-bellied sapsucker in the upper left, the um, northern flicker in the middle left, and the red-bellied woodpecker in the lower left. These are near migrants that um, are, may be still around. Um, depending on where you are, you might get one. Um, in the case of the red-bellied woodpecker, their numbers are increasing um, in our area. So they, 25 years ago, you'd be hard pressed to find them in the winter, um, but now they're more and more regular. And on warmer years, you'll get those flickers sticking around. Um, and even the um, the breeding migrant at the top left, the yellow-bellied sapsucker does stick around. Um, it can stick around into December. I've had them in Pinkham Notch in mid-December. Um, usually the younger birds. Typically, typically it's those younger birds that are going to be those strays that the at the end of the line that are that are leaving last. Um, but uh, but as I said, um, hopefully we'll hopefully get all four here. But um, uh, but uh, things could could change. You know, it could be dependent on the weather um, well, and where you're located. Uh, but the two, I'd say the most common woodpeckers that we have are the, the downy and the hairy woodpecker breeding migrants that we get with high regularity, very common um, species. But it's a great comparison between the two here these can be tough to identify or split from each other when you're when you're down on the ground looking up into the trees. So really what you're going to be doing is um, looking at the face, looking at the the bill structure. So um, it's it's especially helpful to look at the length of the bill. So in the case of the hairy woodpecker, its bill is a, about as long as its skull. Uh, so you can see that in, on the right side, the bill is pretty long there and um, Downey's bill is much shorter. See those those white um, feathers around its the base of its bill, those bristles kind of um, 
obviously they don't go as far out as the bill itself, but the bill kind of just barely peaks out um, beyond those, whereas the, the Harry, it goes much further out. Um, another helpful ID point for this one is that the bird on the left has spots on the white portion of its outer tail feathers, black spots on the white portions of the outer tail feathers. So that's really helpful if you're able to see it, whereas the um, the white outer tail feathers of the hairy woodpecker on the right are clean. They do not have any black dots. So that can be very helpful. Um, downies and hairies will often pair um, pair up with uh, other bre breeding, um, resident breeding birds like our chickadees and and um, and nuthatches. Uh, and so you'll get mixed groups coming through. So sometimes if you get a woodpecker, there's a there's a chance that you, you know, stick around, you might have other species coming through with it. And for those of us further north, um, or for those of us who are just very lucky, you might get this species, the black-backed woodpecker, which is a resident um, bird of northern New Hampshire and in um, north central New Hampshire when the habitat is right. So when you have dense, older uh, stands of black spruce, um, you can get this species. Um, I have tried in vain to get them at Pondicherry, um, but uh, uh, and Trudeau Road um, in Bethlehem, but I have not yet found one. Um, I had a bad look at one once um, while hiking Mount Eisenhower, um, but this is a species I'm still looking for. In some years, um, and this year was one of those years where, oop, this year's this year was one of those years where some of these more northern birds actually came south. So um, this species was one of them. We had one on Monhegan Island, which uh, of course we didn't see, but it was out there um, fairly further south than its regular range. Um, and the boreal chickadees were seen uh, at least one on the coast of Maine, southern coast of Maine this year, uh, this fall, I should say. And very recently, a Canada jay was found in Sandwich, New Hampshire, um, further south of its regular range. So something's going on this year. So keep an eye out for some of these more northern species, which is pretty exciting. Um, and then kind of continuing with some of these northern species here, the, the, the corvids, the, um, the jay, the crow family, um, really uh, charismatic species, um, birds that you usually often find in groups on um, the upper left you have the blue jay, lower left you have the, um, the raven, common raven, American crow in the upper right, and Canada jay, Canada jay in the lower right. So these species are part of the same family, highly intelligent group um, pack hunting uh, birds, and uh, it's, it's great to see them around um, you'll get the, you know, jays with them um, often around your bird feeders, but the ravens and crows, you'll, you'll get them around town. Um, there's a pair of ravens that I, I think nests um, just north of the doll sanctuary, um, kind of along Route 16. Um, I would say near Taco Bell, there's definitely a raven pair uh, around there, which is exciting. Um, and then for those of us doing some hikes into the mountains, you'll get those Canada Jays. Um, they, they live in small groups. They're really adorable birds that seek out people, which is interesting. They're almost like, um, almost instinctual. I think for many of these birds, they're, they might be looking for a novel experience, but in the case of the Canada Jay, they've, so, they've grown so accustomed to um, being fed by people that they, they kind of um, associate people with food. So you might see them up in the mountains, and then if you're super lucky, you might get one further south of their range. Um, but keep an eye out for all of these species uh, during the Christmas bird count. And then continuing with some, um, some of the other breeding resident birds, uh, black cap chickadee on the upper left, boreal chickadee on the upper right. So boreal chickadee, again, like Canada jay, you're going to find the species if you hike up into the, the mountains, you know, um, above 2,500, 3,000 feet elevation. I've had, um, I've had the uh, boreal chickadee on top of some of the, some of the, let's, 
trying to think of the hill that I've walked in Jackson, hiked in Jackson, New Hampshire. You get them at the top of maybe Black Mountain um, in Jackson that I've that I've hiked and had it. Um, so they are, you know, within hiking distance. Um, you can get them maybe about a mile and a half, two miles up the Tuckerman Ravine Trail. Um, if you're willing to, to, if you've got, you know, some of these higher elevations in your count circle um, or on your count route, um, you might get them. But a little bit easier are the, um, the, the more southern species in the lower right. You've got the tufted titmouse, um, which similar to the uh, red-bellied woodpecker of earlier part of the presentation this is a species that has done incredibly well over the last 25 30 years and has made it um, much further north um, and so it, it's considered still relatively rare in northern new hampshire um, but it's but it's becoming much more common so this is a, a common backyard feeder bird along with the black hep chickadee um, bird you will not really get so much of your feeders is the um, it's very small um, very cute Bird in the lower left, very high pitched call of the golden crown kinglet, also a, a group, um, a group kind of bird that you know will glom on to other mixed um, species flocks, and usually, um, usually in association with chickadees in the woods, uh, and usually associating with more of the coniferous forests. I usually see them in, you know, um, hemlock mixed. Uh, possibly even into the spruce uh, fir forest. But in the fall and in the winter, they do seem to be a bit more conspicuous, a little easier to find, a little more likely to be feeding at eye level or even um, down on the ground if you've got some open ground where I was birding just this weekend, uh, last weekend. Um, they were There was a pair kind of in and out of some grass, which was really interesting. Um, and I think this this fall there was a crazy fallout of uh, golden crown kinglets in New Jersey, um, and there were some there were some incredible photos of hundreds of golden crown kinglets that had uh, that were actually somehow moving south in large numbers and were uh, hit with unfavorable weather conditions. And so they were exhausted and hungry and um, people were getting really close up shots of them. Um, you know, in this situation, when you do find any kind of birds that are looking distressed, um, keep your distance, obviously. And if you're if you feel like they are in need of help, um, you know, call call your local um, Audubon Society rehabber. Um, don't necessarily just take it into your own hands um, to to save these birds because you know they are wild animals. Um, but especially as we get into the winter time and people love to take photos of of snowy owls, it's really important to, to keep your distance from these birds that are really just trying to survive the winter. Um, and moving into again more of these uh, breeding resident birds that we get at uh, at least in the case of the two leftmost birds here um, that we'll have at our feeders. Um, these are the nut hatches. The top being the uh, kind of more southern nut hatch, the larger white-breasted nut hatch, and the bottom left the red-breasted nut hatch. Two birds that have the uncanny ability to walk up and down um, the trunks of trees in order to um, look for their their meal. Um, they'll often grab, you know, black oil sunflower seeds from your from your feeder, go off to a tree, and put the seed under bark and hammer away at it, you know, versus the chickadee and nuthatch, which will put the seed right between their their feet and work at it um, on a branch. These two have a different strategy for opening those seeds up. Bird on the right, the brown creeper, um, as this photo aptly shows, will go up trees and often will kind of spiral up uh, the tree trunk as it forages, um, will attach itself to mixed species flocks, but um, I don't see them so much at feeders, but I have heard that they really like peanut butter. So if you want to attract them, you can, or feed them in the winter, you can put some peanut butter out on perhaps a, a tree, um, put it in the bark um, and uh, see, observe to see if that's something that they like to come to. I've heard that they do. I haven't seen it you know, firsthand, but um, they're one of my favorite kind of winter birds to watch. So um, three species that 
very, you know, with the, uh, with good regularity are, are going to be seen on the Christmas bird count for our area. All right, getting into the eruptive uh, finch species. Um, and I say eruptive because I guess if you're further south, you know, places like mid-Atlantic are getting, um, might be getting the uh, purple finches here and maybe from time to time getting these other two crossbill finches. But where we live in central New Hampshire, uh, central northern New Hampshire, you're going to get all, get all three um, all year round. So upper left, you have the white wing crossbill. Um, great uh, photo here showing that crossbill, uh, which is an adaptation of getting um, seeds out of um, really thick cones. Um, really incredible to watch them do their do their thing. And on the right, you have the red crossbill, male up top, female below, and a male purple finch, state bird of New Hampshire, on the lower left. Um, so these are birds that hopefully you'll get um, on the Christmas bird count. It's I would say if you're new um, to birding and you want to try to understand these birds. Better um, look up online. Um, I use allaboutbirds.org, uh, but there's a, some really great software out there, including um, LarkWire, which is a great um, app for understanding bird songs and calls. These birds, I usually identify by sound, and I usually don't see them because they're usually flying over, um, over my head in small groups and very vocal. These birds are very vocal. So, um, look look up their calls online and try to commit to memory the different call notes of these birds and that'll help you tremendously not just during the Christmas bird count but in the future um, because I I don't always have the best eyesight and best ability to see a bird as it's flying especially way up in the sky but I have really sensitive hearing and I've trained my hearing to hear these species so it's really rewarding when you can be out there and hear these things coming coming by and being able to identify them and put them on the Christmas bird count um, even though you didn't uh, see them, but you identified them by sound. It can be really um, helpful, not just for the bird count, but for, um, you know, birding in the future. And that goes for really everything. You know, when you when you get the sound down, um, it opens up a whole new world of, of essentially presence and uh, absence data. So you know where these things are, even if you don't see them, you, know, you can really um, learn a lot about their life uh, by being able to hear them. Um, all right, so kind of moving up into the some of the larger birds that we get, the game birds, um, including another success story, the um, the turkey, the wild turkey in the upper left. These guys, their population has really exploded in the last 30 years. They're doing very well, and I have them with them. Um, very frequently uh, throughout New Hampshire and, and southern Maine where I am. Um, in the upper right you have uh, the ruffed grouse, uh, also pretty abundant um, in our area. And uh, in the lower right you have um, ring-necked pheasant, typically introduced. Um, further south they they thrive through the winter season, but usually they don't. Um, further north they, they don't really survive the winters, but they can be often stocked for hunting purposes um, around. And depending on the winter they might they might live through and be able to breed. Um, but uh, on the lower left you have another species, another uh, breeding um, resident species that you'll find in higher elevations and further north, the spruce grouse. So this is a bird that you're more likely to see a little bit further north. Um, but these four are game birds that, um, you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll get in our Christmas bird count this year. All right, moving into some of the um, forest and uh, forest adjacent uh, habitat predators. You've got the um, uh, red-tailed hawk on the upper left, classic um, large-bodied hawk, Budio, um, which is the, the genus Budio, these kind of rounder winged, heavier bodied um, hawks that love to hunt uh, rodents and usually are kind of pouncers. They'll sit up in a, a tree or on a, um, top of a telephone pole and look down, look around. You often get them in medians on the highway and just kind of pounce on um, on uh, nearby uh, rodents and, and larger um, 
mammals. And uh, so that's like the classic red tailed hawk thing um, to do. But uh, on the lower left, in um, usually in, in kind of open forests and open land uh, locations, you'll get the rough legged hawk. This is a species that is only present in New England in the winter. This is a species that breeds in the um, the tundra further north, um, but comes down to New Hampshire to winter and often is, is more prevalent on the coast, um, usually in those lar uh, larger expanse of, of marshlands um, and coastal kind of scrublands. You'll get this, this bird. And it's um, similar to the kestrel in the way that it will kite or hover over open landscapes um, looking for prey. Um, of course, in the lower middle, you've got our um, another success story of uh, doing doing better than it was doing um, half a century ago, the bald eagle, um, the nation's bird, national bird. Um, so you'll get these up and down the river, usually up and down the Saka River, I should say, usually when um, water's open, they're able to, to catch a fish or maybe they'll try to get some ducks if there's some ducks around. Um, but they'll also come out to carry in um, roadkill, that sort of thing. Um, so, so I've seen them um, pretty frequently um, in North Conway and again usually associating with the river um, river systems. On the right hand side you have two birds that are very uh, closely kind of related at least in their features they look a lot alike. These are the classic forest hawks the um, genus Accipiter. You've got the sharp shinned up top which is a, a smaller um, smaller bird of prey than the uh, related Cooper's hawk below. So there are a couple different field marks that help us distinguish the species. I go at least with the um, sharp chins being smaller, but keep in mind that in the raptors, the female is larger than the male. And so female sharp chins are actually around the same size or could be easily um, observed in the field to be around the same size as the male Cooper's hawk. So keep that keep that in mind. These these two birds can be often um, mistaken for each other. But in the case of the bird up top, it's smaller. It kind of has um, you know faster wing beats when it's when it's flying. Look at that face. I like to say, and many people like to say, it looks like an angry parakeet. So it has that tiny sharp bill. Um, those eyes uh, kind of set a little more forward on the face. Um, the the chest uh, in the immatures are usually kind of a, a messier uh, spotting than in the Cooper's hawk, which has typically more clean cut, narrow black, um, what I would call a uh, pendulum shaped um, black lines that come down vertically. Um, so that's really, that can be helpful, at least in the, in the you know, getting the two um, separated there. In the case of the Cooper's hawk, um, the the adults uh, are just much more of a kind of a, a robust, really in the case, especially in the female, just a much larger bird um, than the than the sharpies, the sharp shinned hawks. Their flight patterns a little bit. Um, a little bit slower, a little bit less buoyant, um, being a larger bird, it's 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 kind of more, uh, you know, it takes more work to, to move that body through space. So they're going to be a little bit slower flappers. Um, and so there, there are a few more um, helpful hints for these two species, but I would certainly, if you want to um, get into the ID uh, minutia, go go online again and look at look at these two species and definitely look at the immature, uh, look at photos of the two side by side, both immature and adult. Um, that can be really helpful and there's a, there's a lot of great little ID features to help you tell them apart. Both of these birds, as I said, they're forest birds and they eat other birds. So they'll often be found near bird feeders. In fact, um, I very I'm very fairly confident that one of these came to a feeder at our house today because um, after some shoveling of snow, I found a pile of feathers uh, right below one of our feeders. So unfortunately, we lost um, a small songbird today, but a um, sharp ear Cooper's got its 
got its winter snack for the day, which is um, which is great. All right, along with our um, kind of the diurnal or daytime uh, raptors of the uh, forests and forest adjacent habitats, you have the nocturnal uh, birds of prey, our, our owls being um, being the prominent nocturnal birds of prey in our area, um, the great horn being the larger of the the common that we have here, great horned owls, um, very imposing and fairly. I mean, if you're going to be out during the day doing the Christmas bird count, and I say that because some some might start very early and try to listen for some owls, which is which is a great thing to do if you want to try to do that. Um, go out and listen for owls before before dawn. Um, that would be that would be great. But uh, but it's harder to find these types of birds in, in the daytime, usually, at least in my experience, I have to just startle one and flush one. Um, and, and, and then they become, you know, they reveal themselves. But um, oftentimes in the day, they're roosting. And so they're not going to be as um, conspicuous, uh, for instance, you know, compared to the, the birds of prey that we just looked at. So great horned on the left, barred owl on the right. Um, great horns I've found in mixed you know, um, northern hardwood forest mixed to field type environments. Um, they kind of go in and out, but the uh, barred owl is typically more of a of a forest, um, you know, restricted to the, the forest. And I get them in the northern hardwood, especially where it, um, it might mix to um, conifers as well. So they, uh, they do like to be able to find places where they're going to be um, roosting during the day and hidden from view. So you might you might have more luck if you want to try to find one to check out some areas with more dense um, conifer foliage. All right, so moving into more of the pure open space uh, habitats and the birds that are typically associated with them. And we do have quite a lot of open space in the North Country in um, North Conway area. And then especially for those of us who um, are along the Saco River Valley um, in the plowed, you know, kind of ag agrarian fields, you can get some of these species. So in the upper left, you have Lapland Longspur, lower left, you have Horned Lark, upper right, you have Snow Bunting, lower right, you have American Pipit. So these are birds that, um, with the exception, well, I should say, with, really with the exception of the horn lark and the, um, uh, the pipit, the two birds on the top are birds that, that nest much further north, so um, up in the taiga, and we'll be checking out North Conway area um, in the wintertime but a bit more common um, closer to the coast where on beaches and coastal marshes and things like that even parking lots um, you'll find you'll find these um, the horn lark and the Amer and the american pipit do breed uh, closer to home um, i've had them uh, down on the coast in the summertime at least in horn lark case and on top of mount washington breeding in the case of the american pipit so these birds are birds of open land uh, open ground. They like to spend a lot of time walking around um, and they they forage in the in the soil uh, when they can. So I typically, you know, if I want to, if you want to see these birds outside of the Christmas bird count, go into um, the the agricultural fields of North Freiburg. You're more likely, in my experience, to find them out there, um, at least locally to the North Conway area, but really stunning birds of open country. Closer to home, um, you've got a number of sparrows that are common um, in the wintertime. Uh, these four in my experience are, are gonna be the more classic wintertime sparrows leading kind of the, the group in abundance this time of year is the dark-eyed junco, which we have breeding um, in our area in the summertime from Mount Washington, even down into the um, into Jackson. They breed on the open ground um, and are down uh, around feeders this time of year. And 
another uh, breeder um, uh, in our area, but typically more in the boreal forest um, is the bird in the upper right, the fox sparrow, a larger um, reddish rusty looking sparrow. Um, does come down to feeders, feeds on the ground as well. So we might luck out and get one of these uh, with more abundance, I'd say in the winter time, um, you're going to have the, the birds on the bottom. So we've got the lower left, you've got the American tree sparrow bird of the tundra that spends its winter here in uh, New England. And then the bird on the lower right, the white throated sparrow, classic um, sparrow of the Alpine zone kind of along with the junco spends a lot of time up there in the summer but are coming through uh came through in large numbers in october and are now kind of dwindling i had two under my feeders today which i was actually surprised but i think it was the, the heavy snow was really concentrating everything around um into the feeder area but i hadn't really seen um a white-throated sparrow in a couple of weeks. So they are around, but in, in smaller numbers. But the sparrows you're more likely to get, Christmas bird count of the junco and the um, American tree, and lesser extent, the fox um, and the white-throated sparrow. And then depending on where you are, you might get, um, you might get one of these sparrows. Uh, these four breed in the North uh, Conway area in the summertime. The um, bird on the upper left is the song sparrow, and um, they they are round in small numbers this time of year. I typically, find them in the same areas that I would find the bird on the lower right, the so the uh, um, the swamp sparrow, and that's usually associated with swamps, um, cattail marshes, and um, uh, areas that have a lot of that kind of mid level. Um, height dense and dense um, kind of grouping of, of those plants and you, you usually find them um, also associating with feeders um, this time of year. The bird in the lower left is the savanna sparrow also as I mentioned a breeder here uh, in the summer but is more often associated with the coast in the winter time, but you get do get them from on occasion um, further inland, where the again where the ground is open, you've got seeds that these birds can take um, readily. You'll you'll have them in the upper right, um, a bird that is probably not going to be as common on the winter on the Christmas bird count, but you but you might luck out. That's the chipping sparrow, um, really uh, abundant in the summertime. Um, but is a uh, kind of a, a near migrant um, in the in the winter, so it'll be more common in the mid Atlantic. But you might get a couple stragglers here. I've had them into no, mid November in North Conway, but you never know. Um, you might luck out. These birds, you know, they look pretty similar. Um, sparrows are, can be really tough uh, with the with the song sparrow. If you can see my cursor, we talk about this. Um, dark uh, handlebar mustache, um, which is just below the the bill on both sides of the bill. This black kind of triangular shaped um, uh, region of feathers. So that can be really helpful. They have long tails, um, and they um, again they're they're going to be associating with um, typically with other birds, but uh, very much kind of ground foragers. Um, in the case of the swamp sparrow, very reddish wings, very clean, um, uh, unstreaked belly, uh, which is also the case of the of the um, chipping. But look at the chipping's eyes. You need this, really note this dark eye line that goes right through, um, right through the eye from um, right off the bill into the uh, back of the head. So that's really helpful. And in the case of the, um, the uh, savanna, uh, Typically you're, typically, you're going to get this yellow uh, between the, the eye and the bill, the lore area that's typically yellow. Um, their bills usually, uh, when you see them in the field, just kind of a um, shorter, sharper bill and um, really kind of uh, neater um, streaks on the sides than the song sparrow, which has more of this, um, you know, broader, uh, messier kind of streaking going on. And in the song sparrow, typically you'll get the um, a kind of a diamond shaped dark um, spot of feathers in the chest and the upper chest area. So that's really helpful. So um, 
with again with all these openland birds you're going to have some some openland predators um, the birds on the two birds on the left are uh, falcons so the peregrine falcon the larger uh, of the two this is a bird uh, peregrine the wanderer um, it really found all over really all over the world um, all over the united states and is uh, going to be around, you know, our area too, if there's enough food. Um, I had one about two weeks ago on the coast. Um, so, that, you know, if they, if they like the area, they might stick around, but you never know. Um, many of them have moved south for the winter, um, but, uh, but if the, you know, if something that they like is around then they'll stick around. In the case of the Merlin, they are um, a breeding migrant that um, typically leave the area in the um, in the deeper winter but you might have some individuals around I think the last one I had about was about three weeks ago but you never know smaller falcon um, you know look at the look at that classic falcon face with that sharp bill um, fierce looking eyes with that kind of um, dark spot just below the eye uh, look look for these again in open land environments but you might also get them in forests um typically that's going to be where they're going to be nesting um but in uh in the winter time you can kind of get them in a mix um in a mix of habitats on the right you have more of a mixed um forest slash open land hawk that is perhaps becoming more um abundant in our area this is the red-shouldered hawk and um similar to the um, to the red-bellied woodpecker is is a bird that's probably moving into our area um, perhaps with climate change this is a bird that's really abundant in the um, southeast and mid-atlantic and you get them kind of in a smattering up in uh, new england um, but uh, again they're a they're kind of like that red tail hawk very um, kind of larger bodied bird likes to just sit and perch and and pounce down on rodents so if you get a you know if you get these larger bodied um what are called the budio hawks the genus budio um take a look uh, at these two species and i mean the red shouldered and the red tailed in your bird app or online and really get a feel for the adult and the and the younger birds the immature birds and what their plumage looks like in the winter time so they can be they can be tough to uh distinguish for the the intro and even intermediate and novice birders get thrown off all the time um, with these species. So um, take a look at those, and uh, it would be really nice to get a red shoulder, a red shoulder hawk on the Christmas bird count. That would be a great target species. And what would be really nice to see would be a snowy owl. So snowy owls are another tundra breeding bird that come down in the in the fall and spend their spend their winters along the coast usually in in areas that uh re, kind of remind them of home so open fields um beaches salt marshes uh plum island in massachusetts is like the classic um new england place to see snowy owls and sometimes you'll see them even on top of uh rooftops and that sort of thing but um they hunt mammals um out in the open and they're, they can be tough to distinguish from a, a pile of snow. So if you're out on um, on your Christmas bird count in an open area, definitely take a scan of the landscape and really hone in on those piles that look like they could be um, just a just kind of a dirty snow pile, but it might might be a snowy owl. So keep a, keep an eye out. All right, so getting into your backyard environment, orchards, feeders, so areas that have kind of scattered trees on, uh, you know, the areas that have fruiting trees, especially, this can get um, a whole assemblage of species that are really, um, really spectacular. So among those spectacular species, we've got our um, our, our wax wings up top. So the, the cedar wax wing in the upper right and the bohemian in the upper left. Cedar is more of a common year round bird that we have. And then the bohemian we have um, in the winter time. And look at the undertail of those species that really tells um, the difference there. The bohemian with that dark chestnut under the, under the um, tail uh, versus the white in the cedar wax wing. 
and below you have pine grosbeaks. This is an adult male pine grosbeak. Females are uh, have a yellow cast. The males have this rosy red cast, and then the younger birds are just kind of a patchy version um, of their of the adults. So all three of these are really common at. Um, ornamental uh, crab apples. So up and down the strip in North Conway, I've had these species in uh, the Walmart parking lot, that sort of thing. So anywhere we have those um, those apple trees, be on the lookout for this um, these groups, these species in groups. They are very gregarious um, uh, species. So they like to be with their kind, sometimes in mixed flocks as well. Um, so check you know, if you have a group of cedar waxwings, check over it and make sure you don't have any bohemians hiding among them. And then getting into, uh, again, more of the eruptive finches. So um, really uh, these birds that you're gonna get more in abundance in the winter time then in the summer, um, again, depending on where you are, uh, this year we've had all four of these in, uh, in pretty good numbers where I am in Southern Maine. Um, the evening gross beak on the upper left, um, a bird that's been declining in the east uh, versus its populations out in the, in the west coast. This is um, a, a, one of the larger uh, finches that erupts into our area. Um, really spectacular, this is an adult male females a um, bit duller in their coloration, um, but they come to feeders. Black oil sunflower seed is kind of their specialty. Lower left, you have pine siskin. They were here in big numbers, but have moved through. Just got a couple um, in the last couple days, which has been nice. Um, lower right, you have a common red pole, very similar in um, plumage to the siskin, but with that beautiful um, red cast in the in the face, in the upper chest and um, on the forehead. And then really common species, you've got the American goldfinch <coughs> um, on the upper right. So hopefully we'll get all, all four of these on the Christmas bird count. And kind of selectively, if we're lucky, we'll get uh, both of these species similar looking, but very different in their, um, in their uh, kind of behavior and habits. Upper left, you have uh, the predatory and um, actually bird eating and mammal eating um, northern shrike, which is a bird that comes down in the wintertime that lives up in the boreal forest and further north in the summer. Um, looks a lot like the bird on the lower right, which is the um, northern mockingbird, but notice it has a hooked bill, has that um, kind of black visor over its eyes, and usually they love the, uh, I believe their Latin name, means sentinel butcher. So they, they are the, also known as the butcher bird. And I like sentinel um, because they love to sit at the tops of trees and kind of be on the lookout. So be, be on the lookout for this bird as it uh, perches up high as they're moving through um, the, uh, the landscape on your Christmas bird count. And <clears throat> similar to um, some of the birds before, this the bird on the lower right, the mockingbird, really likes uh, to be around um, kind of, well, I usually find them, at least in North Conway, associating with people. Um, they are kind of up and down the strip in North Conway um, in the more residential areas, uh, but in the same kind of areas as the, uh, the waxwings. So I've seen them kind of feeding on the same kinds of uh, plants as the waxwings do. So some of the more ornamental uh, varieties. All right. so. Um, I want to try to be mindful of the time. So we're going to move through um, some of the remaining groups here. So we've got um, some of the more common species here that might be lingering, your robins, your bluebirds, your blackbirds on the bottom, but then um, probably more likely to be getting the uh, morning doves and cardinals on our Christmas bird count. Um, <clears throat> especially uh, as you you know go around and associate with feeders, the robins are going to be more likely on those ornamental um, trees. So look around um, for robins when you're looking around for the uh, gross beaks uh, and waxwings. And then, of course, you're going to also get some of the birds that we might consider as unwanted um, house sparrows, 
lower left, starlings upper right, um, feral pigeon, a rock, rock dove, feral pigeon lower right, and house finches, which are pretty common in the village of North Conway and around uh, residential areas. So these are birds you should definitely keep an eye out for. And then um, kind of our final habitat is open water and, and rivers, really. So the, the open water that we're going to have uh, in our area are rivers um, this time of year, especially as the cold air settles in. So um, these two birds, opportunists, that you're usually going to find further south in the winter, but if the water's open, you're going to get great blue herons and um, belted kingfishers around. They're definitely going to be around if you've got open water. And then along with that, you've got a number of different uh, ducks, um, waterfowl that can be found in open water. Um, closer to the coast, you're going to have bufflehead in the upper right, um, ringneck duck and pintail and green winged teal. These species you can get in a, um, abundance, especially in October and November. But as, uh, as it gets colder, you're going to get fewer and fewer. Um, and along with that, again, open water, um, you've got American black duck, mallard, common merganser, and on the lower left, um, two species of golden eye. I made sure I got a photo that had both species together, the barrows golden eye in the upper left, the common golden eye in the lower right. Barrows has those like almost like window type uh, uh, plumage spots in its wing and a beautiful like cr almost crescent moon uh, white spot on its face. Uh, so that's helpful to ID that one versus its um, relative, the common golden eye. Um, so these again are very much associated with the open water in the winter time um, and much more common as you get closer to the coast and you get those um, saltwater uh, inland bays and um, estuaries and that sort of thing. Um, and again, species that you have in abundance in the summertime that are less common in the winter. But I've had um, in rivers in North Freiburg all uh, all these species um, in the in the winter time. So, you know, whenever you get any kind of open water, be be on the lookout for waterfowl. You really never know what you're going to find um, when when you do get some of that open water. And two, um, open water or not, um, these the gulls are, you know, another species that you can find um, associating with open water, but also sometimes just open spaces and and even more um, around people. Uh, the birds on the right, the herring gull on the lower right, and the ring-billed gull love to, you know, take food from people if they can. Um, and then you've got the glaucus gull and the um, Iceland gull, the glaucus on the upper uh, left, Iceland on the lower left, are birds that breed further north and come down and spend their winters um, around uh, New England and point south. So um, much more likely to find the two on the left in the wintertime, um, typically closer to the coast, but you can get them inland. I've seen records of both these species in Berlin, for instance, and in, in Gorham. Um, but the birds on the right, much more likely to get. And then finally, if you're out there and you see a very large gull with dark wings, um, it's very likely to be getting um, the great blackback gull. You can get the lesser blackback gull as well in um, smaller numbers closer to the coast um, as well. But, uh, but if you get a large dark gull, um, observe it closely um, and chances are it's probably going to be a, a great blackback gull, which you can get inland. Um, in the winter time, but again, much more common on the coast. Um, so with that, we're just after eight. Um, so I want to be mindful of the time, but I'd love to take any questions um, that you have about a uh, common bird ID um, for our winter uh, winter season and the Christmas bird count. Thank you. And... All right, thank you, Will. Um... <clears throat> Yeah, so um, folks, if you have questions for Will, you can go ahead and um, and just unmute yourself or you can type directly into the chat feature and I will will read those out to Will. Oh, yes. The gray J is the same as the Canada, Canada J. Hey, Tom. Um, so part of my uh, in my area to count is a is a, a house with a feeder and he's had 
a flock of about 50 um, evening gross beaks this week. How will the snowfall have affected them? Might they have moved on? That's a good question. Um, they, I think it might depend on the, the prevailing wind direction after this storm moves through. So some of these birds like to, you know, take advantage of those wind currents um, with storms. But, you know, in the case of the evening grove speaks, they're, they're kind of in the winter nomadic. Many of them have headed south already. So if you've got a big group, as long as you're feeding them and they're there, they might just stick through for another couple few weeks. Um, like earlier, I had pine, uh, yeah, pine siskins that came through that I thought were completely out of the picture um, as of mid-October, but there's still quite a quite a few around. So I would I would, you know, hope that they stick around for the weekend. All right, thank you. Yeah. I just say to Tom's question that that the grosbeak I bet will stay around. They're a pretty common winter bird. They 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 normally breed in mountains and colder environments as well. So I'd be I'd be I would bet on it. Obviously, they're birds; they can fly away. But I think you're going to be safe, Tom. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, I had I had a flock of grosbeaks at my feeder all day today in the middle of the snow, just all day in holes. Awesome. This awesome. is that's great. So we're in the same we're in the sandwich bird count, but I can relate. Yeah, I noticed today there were all kinds of birds at our feeder. Um, white throated sparrows I thought they had left months ago but it's it's really interesting what happens during snowstorms that's really the you know it's like it's like the pub <laughs> it brings all these birds together and there were it was really fascinating to see what birds were were kind of fighting with each other and which birds were winning the fights there was a clear packing order between various species um you know with Junko with finch, uh, house finch with um, even had a purple finch at one time. Um, and then, you know, the nuthatches and the downy woodpeckers, everything kind of fit into this really neat hierarchy of who gets the food and when. All right, any other questions for for Will, I'm expecting lots of good and solid ideeing on our bird count on uh, on Saturday. Um, Great. I don't know, Will. You wowed us all, and I will. Um, we did record this because I know as we're you know I always with with Will's bird programs I always feel like the first half it's like a really solid got this, I've got this. And then as they start stacking up, um, you know, it's like, oh wait, now I need to go back and compare it to this, you know, to that other species. So um, we will um, we'll be putting this up um, on, uh, on, our, on our YouTube page. Oh, and it looks like, Will, a question came in. Do Merlin's raid feeders? That's a great question. Um, I've definitely heard of them coming in and grabbing birds from from feeder areas, um, so certainly they could be they could predate the birds that are at the feeders. But I typically find them more, you know, chasing down. Well, in my experience, they're definitely out there getting things like cedar waxwings. Typically, find them chasing after other birds that are themselves fairly fast flyers, um, shorebirds, and things like that. But I I don't see why they wouldn't come down and grab something that's kind of associating with a feeder. Oh, here's a oh, great question. question. Yes, one we've yeah, that's come up a lot. All right, Thanks, well, we want to tackle um, uh, feeder counting etiquette because I know we have a lot of feeder counters here. Yeah. If you happen to live in our count circle and we haven't grabbed you already, um, please email either me or Katie. We would love to, um, you know, we would love to have you just give a take yeah. a count at your feeder and send the tally to us and so yeah so in my experience you count the the greatest numbers of birds present at one time within that species so if you are at your feeder or out at your window and watching your feeder and you have you know seven gross beaks and then later that same day you have you know five gross beaks the number that you submit 
is seven. So you, you take that greater number. Um, that's at least what I've learned is the etiquette for the Christmas bird count. If I'm out birding and I'm in a place and I see seven and a little while later I see, you know, three or five, they might be different birds and I might, I might kind of make an average or something like that. But in my experience, it's the higher number um, when you're counting your, your birds at your feeder. Right, and we, I, I, I put that up there, um, Will. So if you were seven and then you saw three and then later you saw nine, it's nine you go with. It's nine yeah. you go with, yeah. Don't add them up. It's always the highest number of that species. Species. Yeah. So if you are doing a feeder watch and you can, you know, and, and you only have one window of time, maybe you're watching, you know, in the morning as you're preparing to go out and do something, then you're going to, you know, you're going to go with the highest number that you see at your feeder at one time. Then, you know, if you have the luxury of checking in at your feeder a couple different times during the day, that's when, yeah, you might have that seven, nine, three, and go with the largest number. Um, well, I know, and I don't know if you have any suggestions on this, a few people have expressed concern with, it's one thing if you sort of see them all at the feeder at the same time, but when you've got birds that are flitting in and out, going and grabbing a seed and going and taking it up to a tree, um, you know, that can be a little bit tricky to, you know, to be counting um, like your chickadee numbers. Yeah. Yeah, that can be tough. I'd say just tr just try to keep track of where they're going. And if you're noticing that something, there's a consistent pattern of where they're going and coming from, and you really see, you know, two different individuals coming in based on where they're, where they keep coming from, um, you might want to call that two and not one. Um, but as you're around your feeder and really focusing on the birds around the feeder area, um, you really you will start to get a feel for the numbers um, of things that are coming. You know, for instance, at Tin Mountain, we know that throughout the day and even throughout the season, you get all different individual chickadees that come through. Um, it's not the same birds all the time, but that might that might not be apparent to you as a Christmas bird counter. Um, so we want to be more conservative in our numbers on the Christmas bird count and really, um, really try to differentiate between that one and two, you know, tufted titmouse that might come through. Um, just, just spend some time looking at where they're going and make a kind of educated guess if it is, you know, multiple individuals. Uh, oh, Rick is also suggesting this. If you're out in the woods, for instance, and you are um, and you might hear a bird and it's far away from you, it, it, it can be very helpful and advantageous to make a pishing sound. So you're imitating the sound of an angry tufted titmouse. We can all try it. Um, and that alerts the birds that there's some kind of predator or some kind of threat in the area and so they will come to that bird that's making that sound um, come to that you know come come to the sound and you might be surprised by all the things that come out of the woods um, it's a good idea to just do that a couple times and not overuse it um, because you, you don't want to stress the birds out especially these cold short days they want to spend their time feeding and not kind of coming after you. So um, do it a couple times and you'll be surprised at the diversity that comes out of the woods. Would you like to give us um, what one yeah. thing? Yeah. Um, so we like the uh, no, Char I here. think Charlie has something to say. It's all right. Yeah, I was going to just say it, it, maybe it's a bit esoteric, but in the count numbers, there are a few species where you can tell the male from the female, like a group, even grow speaks, pine mm -hmm. grow speaks cardinals. So you may get clusters of birds. And if you can, you know, that might help you bump up the count a little bit when you're yeah. at the feeders. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Look for differences in the individuals if you can, even, even, you know, between individuals of the same gender, they might look a little different. Um, well, we are getting multiple requests for that pitching audio. <laughs> all right. All right. So you put your, your lips together and you make like a sound so try to try to um well try listening to the sound of, of a tip mouse online if you can but they do make that like so really turn up the turn up the anger <laughs> anger tip mouse on oh, the angry tip mouse um but yeah 
it, it, it really works. It's pretty incredible. All right, great. Thank you uh, for that. Yeah. We, um, do we have any more questions for Will? Um, we do, we do appreciate you putting this on for us tonight and, and very much appreciate you coming and joining us for um, the camp <clears throat> on Saturday. Um, yeah, enjoy it, everyone. This should be really exciting. This might you be- You know what, can I add something? This is a little else. different this year because we won't be having a compilation. Right. So how can people find out uh, right. what was seen? Yeah, so there are two ways. And actually, when we talked today, we revisited sort of the, the lack of compilation. And because it's probably going to take us a little bit longer to tally, um, we will be sending out an email. Um, so that will go out to any, if you got an initial bird count um, email, even if you're not volunteering or if you're on our Bird Society um, email list, we'll send you that <clears throat> count. Um, if you're, if you don't think you're on that list, you can um, email me or just email info at tinmountain.org. We will get those results to you, but we are planning now on um, just doing a summary check-in, um, particularly for those folks that are joining the, um, joining us on the count um, on either Monday or Tuesday evening, just so there is that um, social aspect to share some of the more interesting finds. Um, and we will be, so we'll send out more information about that tomorrow. Um, but yeah, so there will be an email summary and then, um, you know, we will have a, another, a Zoom check-in for anyone who wants to join us on that. Great. All right. <clears throat> Thanks everybody. I think yes, we had a good turnout tonight. Thank you, Will, that was great. All right. Yes, hopefully I'll Perfect. see you on Saturday. Yeah, I'm excited to see what we all see on um, Saturday.